Today we're going to talk about drawing great intuitive Lewis structures. Lewis structures are simply models for covalent molecules. They're one of the most common ways we use to draw covalent compounds. We're going to focus on a few rules and then work our way to a fundamental understanding of why we get these shapes, why we get these drawings and depictions of these covalent molecules. So before we get into drawing molecules, I want to start out with five specific rules that, that are going to help us along the way. Rule number one is that hydrogen is only going to make one bond. Rule number two, also with hydrogen, is that you're only going to find hydrogen as a peripheral atom. What that means is that it's going to be basically on the outside of the structure. And we're going to see that time and time again today. Rule number three has to do with oxygen. And that rule is simply that oxygen is very rarely going to be found bound to itself. So only in the case of a few molecules, peroxides, for example, are you going to find oxygen actually bound to itself. And so it's pretty safe to assume that for a lot of these common Lewis structures, you're going to find oxygen bound to something else, not itself. Rule number four is a nice rule that we're going to use a little bit later on, and that's that hydrogen only wants two electrons to fill its valence shell, whereas the common elements carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine are going to require eight electrons. Now that rule kind of carries over to other elements, especially when dealing with peripheral atoms. But later on, when we draw more advanced Lewis structures, you're going to see that that can kind of break down. You can have more than eight electrons surrounding elements as long as they have access to the d orbitals. The last rule that we're going to talk about right now is simply that when we draw these structures, a line is going to represent two shared electrons. So a line is simply a covalent bond. On the other hand, we're going to have dots on our structure, and those dots are going to represent lone pair electrons. In other words, they're electrons that are not shared, rather they're just hanging out on one of the atoms in the structure. So next I want to build a small foundation of our intuitive understanding of these molecules. And so this is something that I honestly didn't learn until organic chemistry, but I feel like it's really, really important in the very beginning. So I'm going to write that these are the neutral forms of some of these elements. So I'm going to write carbon. It's going to look something like this, which is simply what I'm writing here is that it is simply four bonds around the carbon. Now those can be double bonds, they can even be triple bonds, but we expect carbon to be surrounded by four bonds. Nitrogen is expected to have three bonds and a single lone pair. Oxygen, two bonds and two lone pairs. And then fluorine and really any peripheral halogen is expected to have one bond and three lone pairs. If you want to understand what's really happening here, what we're saying is that carbon, if you found it on the periodic table, which is right up here, it's going to have four valence electrons. And what we said in rule four up above is that carbon wants to fill its valence shell with eight electrons. And so what it's going to need is basically four electrons from other species. And what that turns into is simply four bonds around carbon. Like I said, it doesn't have to look exactly like this. You can have something like carbon dioxide that looks like this. And that's still four bonds, but there are two double bonds, so it doesn't look exactly like that intuitive structure that I showed. But the point of showing you this right now is to make sure that you don't draw something like methane, for example, which is CH4. And you go out and maybe at first you want to get really creative and say, oh, it looks something like this. 
And what that's doing is that's violating our intuitive rules. Number one, the carbon doesn't look like this over here. And number two is it's violating our rule that says that hydrogens have to be peripheral. They have to be surrounded by two electrons and they only make one bond. So that's a big time violation of a lot of rules right there. So now while we still have these rules up, I want to draw a few common Lewis structures. Let's begin with a pretty simple one. Let's do NH3 or ammonia. So the way to approach Lewis structures from the very beginning is to use a rule that shows that S is equal to N minus A. And what that's saying is the number of shared electrons, or S, is going to be equal to the amount of electrons that are needed to fill the valence of each element in your structure minus the available electrons that are provided by the valence shell of each element in your structure. So for ammonia, what this looks like is the needed electrons, N, will be equal to the amount of electrons we need in total. So for nitrogen, N is going to be equal to 8 because rule number 4, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine want to have 8 electrons. But then you also have 3 hydrogens and in rule number 4 it also states that hydrogen needs 2 electrons. So we have 3 hydrogens and each one of those need two electrons. And so in total, our N is going to be equal to 14. Our available electrons are simply what each atom is going to provide us in that structure. And so nitrogen is going to provide us with the amount of electrons that are in its valence. So we can easily use the group number to tell us that. So nitrogen is in group five, and therefore it's going to provide us with five electrons. Hydrogen is in group one and so it's going to give us one electron and that's going to be equal to a grand total of eight electrons. So I put all this together and notice how I'm just doing a little bit of math. I'm not doing any drawing of a structure just yet and the reason is when I take this difference and I get that shared is equal to six, what that's telling me is that I have six electrons that are occupied in bonds. So in order to get the number of bonds, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this six, I'm going to divide it by two because each bond has two electrons in it, and that's going to be equal to my number of bonds. And so I expect to have simply three bonds in this structure. So I'm going to draw it out. And one of the most important rules here is going to be rule number two that says that hydrogen is always going to be peripheral. It's going to be on the outside of the structure. Now we can take a deeper look into what that means. So nitrogen, I'm not going to go off and do something like this because now I have a central hydrogen atom and you know it's violating other rules as well. But I want to spread my hydrogens out, create a structure that looks like this, and that's a really good skeletal structure. However, you always need to do one additional check, and that check is to make sure that you used all the electrons that you had available. You're going to learn that later on that available term is the most important term here because it's the one thing that is absolutely set in stone. If you have nitrogen and three hydrogen that means you have eight electrons there. And in my structure that I drew I'm only actually using six electrons. That's two in each bond. And so what do I do with those remaining two electrons? And the answer is, I'm going to use rule number four to tell me exactly where they belong. My hydrogens are all complete in their valence. They all have two electrons around them. However, my nitrogen only has six electrons around. 
So coincidentally, I have two electrons that still need placing. And so what do I do with them? I put them right on that central atom. And now my nitrogen is surrounded by two, four, six, eight electrons. And that's perfect. So I satisfied all my rules. I followed the procedure and I got the correct structure. So let's do something a little bit more difficult here. And the next one that we're going to draw is going to look a little bit like this. And And so at first you might be looking at this and you might just start drawing, come up with something. And what you want to realize is that if you fall back on your rules, you can use your intuition to confirm whether the structure is going to work or whether you really need to go through the steps and make sure that you are following the right idea to draw this structure. And one of the things that is really jumping out at me right now when I'm looking at this is that I am completely violating rule number three. I have two oxygens bound together and that can happen, but, it, but it's better to try something else before you try to force that to happen. And so watch how things are going to fall into place once I use my rules. And so I'm going to start with S is equal to N minus A. And for my needed, I'm going to count up everything that I need. So my hydrogens, I've got two and I need two electrons to fill the valence. I have two oxygen and those are each going to need eight. And similar with the carbon, I have one that also needs eight. And so I'm going to add all these together and that's going to be four plus 16 plus eight that's going to be equal to 28 electrons needed. And what that means is that's the amount of electrons that are needed to fill the valence of each atom in my covalent molecule. For my available, that's going to be the sum of all the valence electrons provided by each atom. And that's going to be one from each of the hydrogen plus six from each of my oxygen and then four from my one carbon. So that's going to be equal to 18 electrons. And so now I can take my difference and that's going to be 28 minus 18, which is going to be equal to 10 shared electrons. But remember what I'm really interested in is dividing by two and then getting five bonds and now I can start to draw my structure and one of the most important things that I'm going to do here is I'm going to make sure that those oxygens are not bound to each other and so I'm going to draw this out and I kind of want to do something like this and maybe I can start with putting this hydrogen right here but for now, I just want to draw this correctly. And I want to tell you that the shortcut to understanding the configuration here is to understand that this is a carboxylic acid functional group. And this will always, whenever you see this, take on a look like this. And so let's take a look at our intuitive structures over here. I definitely want four bonds around my carbon two bonds around each oxygen. So if I started kind of left to right here and just drew single bonds around everything, I see that I've satisfied that in all cases except that central carbon and the oxygen that's right up here at the top. And I'm just gonna fix that very quickly by drawing a double bond right here. Now this is going to take a lot of practice before you see how that comes together, but you want to get to the point where you're looking at this and you want to be able to quickly fix a situation like this uh, to get everything looking the way you want it. And one of the reasons why I was able to make that conclusion to add that bond 
is that in my structure before, I only had four bonds, but I needed one more. So it makes a lot of sense that I can put an extra bond right there. With all five of those bonds, we used a total of 10 electrons. And like I said, the most important number here is our available number of electrons. And so we have, look at that, eight electrons left to place. But if I look at my hydrogen, that's good. That has two electrons around it. Same with the other hydrogen. And the carbon has eight electrons around it. It looks great. The oxygens, however, each of them only has four electrons around it. And we can also refer back to this intuitive structure over here that a neutral oxygen is going to have two bonds and two lone pairs. And so I can put all that together and draw these lone pairs in. I'm going to use up the rest of my eight electrons. And now all of a sudden, both my oxygens have eight electrons around them. And that is a pretty tough structure to draw.